اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین خاتم النبیین سیدن الممجد بشیر المصدق المصطفى الامجد محمود الاحمد ابي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على الظالمين من الاولين والاخرين اما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لله ملك السماوات والارض ويوم تقوم الساعه يومئذ يخسر المبطلون وترى كل امه جاثيه كل امه تدعى الى كتابها اليوم تجزون ما كنتم تعملون هذا كتابنا ينطق عليكم بالحق إنا كنا نستنسخ ما كنتم تعملون فأما الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات فيدخلهم ربهم في رحمته ذلك هو الفوز المبين وأما الذين كفروا أفلم تكن آياتي تتلى عليكم فاستكبرتم وكنتم قوما مجرمين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وال محمد awaited savior of humanity imam al mahdi alayhi salam my respected teachers scholars elders brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The way a person treats another is often indicative of how he treats his own self. When a person comes to really understand, when the veils are dropped and a person really is seen for who they are, the way in which a person treats another is indicative of how they treat themselves. If the way in which they treat another person is with honor dignity justice then you would imagine that he within himself or herself treats his self in that very same way but of course if the person is a bully or is vengeful the way in which they treat others externally outside of them is a glimpse into the reality of what is taking place within themselves Similarly, a community or a nation, the way in which that nation and community treats other nations or treats other communities is going to be an indication as to how it treats its own communities. When the veils are lifted and a person can see through all of the different lies, when a person realizes how that nation or that community treats others you will normally be able to see how that community will treat its own people if the community or the nation is a nation that spreads peace abroad you would imagine that by priority it would be able to spread peace at home whereas when that nation is a nation that spreads war and suffering abroad even if it is not today then tomorrow it will reap what it sows and bring home those very same terrors to its own communities the politics that we see today by virtue of it being a politics of breeding war and social upheaval abroad 
it must be that eventually that breeds into the psyche of those people at home and they themselves will adopt those very same ideals for themselves, bringing about a state of tumult in their own societies. You've all heard of the military industrial complex, right? Yes? The military industrial complex does what? It is those businesses that profit off the suffering of human beings because the technological advancements that they make are not for the purpose of bringing people out of their poverties or bringing people out of their darknesses rather they are created for the purpose of putting people into harm and putting peoples into conflict what does the military industrial complex do? Invariably, it will arm both or all sides of the conflict. Because the more I arm you, the more you need to arm yourself to protect yourself from him. And the more you have protected yourself with arms, militarized yourself, the more he also needs to buy arms to weaponize himself what happens when the business isn't arms what happens within a society when what is being weaponized is the culture of one group against another and another against another until each side is as weaponized in their own culture and dispute as they would be with any other type of weapon. The culture war industry must also arm all sides and then profits from those armings of all sides. Preferably, the war that they create amongst communities should be futile and fractal in order to keep it burning for longer and longer. And eventually, those people that cannot see what is happening in front of their very eyes will end up being the source of the destruction of their own society or downfall of their own society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a most fascinating verse in the Quran from Surah Al Ankabut. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter number 29, verse number 38. The relationship between the downfall of a society and those who witness what is occurring in front of them. They are not blinded to the realities of the wars that are existing between themselves. And as a result, even though they see it, they are helpless in the downfall of their own civilization or society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the following. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَعَادًا وَثَمُودًا وَقَدْ تَبَيَّنَ لَكُمْ مِنْ مَسَاكِنِهِمْ وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ فَصَدَّهُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلٍ وَكَانُوا مُسْتَبْصِرِينَ Let's read this verse, break it down into parts, and I want you to become very conscious of your own societies and our own Western civilization and the way in which communities and cultures are pitted against one another such that the downtrodden are pushed further down and the elite are brought further up. What is the outcome of that in a society from the Quranic perspective? Review this verse with me. Pay close attention. And we're going to really focus on this verse this evening and come back to it time and time again, inshaAllah. Wa'adan wa thamuda. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and Ad and Thamud, as you know, they were the communities of Prophet Hud and Salih. Salamullahi alayhi ma. Wa'adan wa thamuda. And Ad and Thamud, their destruction. And everything that happened to them. 
وقد تبين لكم من مساكنهم it is clear to you it is made obvious to you about their ruined dwellings why would allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say to the people of arabia that the dwelling places of the previous communities that have been destroyed are so well known to you because as you know much of those societies were traders and so they would travel across the various tracks in order to be able to go different parts of Arabia all the way into northern Africa into the Levant to be able to sell their goods so if you were coming from Yemen or if you were coming from the Levant or if you were coming from Iraq or if you're coming out of Mecca all of these different regions and locations they would travel across similar paths that were safe for them to go away from highway robbers known paths that allowed them to be able to reach water resources and oasis and as such they knew very well the history of their own civilizations including the locations of those communities that had been destroyed before them it's like when any of us go on holiday you might go to Italy you might go to Greece right and you often go to these sites of great historical importance right you'll go to those locations where you're told the great philosophers of Athens used to sit you'll go to those places in Rome where the great cathedrals were where the Roman Empire sat right you see the marks the locations the athar of the history of our own Western civilizations we marvel and we learn their history and we recall their ups and their downs their rises and their falls in the same way the Arab community did exactly the same and they regaled each other with their stories and this is why their stories were so well known even before the Quran came to edify them for all eternity وعادن وثمودا وقد تبين لكم من مساكنهم but what happened to Adan Thamud وزين لهم الشيطان أعمالهم شيطان made their actions fair seeming to them made it beautiful to them they ran towards the acts which shaytan had led them towards tasaddahum an sabil or an sabil my apologies tasaddahum an sabil allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in shaytan he then blocks them from the path of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all this is quite well known to you right this is not probably anything new the end of this ayah is supremely important to understanding how the Prophet ﷺ built his society, how we build our own societies. وَعَادًا وَثَمُودًا وَقَدْ تَبَيَّنَ لَكُمْ مِنْ مَسَاكِنِهِمْ وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ فَصَدَّهُمْ عَنِ السَّبِيلِ وَكَانُوا مُسْتَبْصِرِينَ Now it's difficult for me to translate this because there's various ways you could explain this. But let me word it in this way. They were people who were able to see the truth. Mustabsirin. They were people of vision, insight, awareness. They knew what was going on. Now think about this. We talked about this over these last few nights. That there's a siyaq in the ayah, right? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the ayah, how he ends the ayah, the relationship between those things. You remember yesterday? We talked about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the verse of Hadid Ayan. Allah gives us these qualities of these communities and how they should act. And at the end of it, he mentions his own asma and his own sifat. He says that he is qawiyun, qawiyun, aziz. Which gives us the indication that if we follow that, our communities would also be qawiyun, aziz. Allah jalla jalalahu in this ayah, is telling us Ad and Thamud they were people who were destroyed but they were mustabsirin they had vision they understood the truth yet they ended up being destroyed 
which tells us something very important. It tells us that a group of people, a community, can be well aware of truth and falsehood. But because, as the ayah says, shaitan made their a'mal fair seeming to them, they were able to justify the evils within their society, it didn't stop them. Their knowledge of truth didn't stop them from being destroyed at the end of the day. Now, according to His Eminence, Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Taqi al Mudarrasi, may Allah grant him a long life, in his tafsir, he says, not only is this the case, that they knew the truth, and as an outcome of their running towards the footsteps of shaitan, that they were destroyed, that they had knowledge and insight of the truth, he said, the lesson for you and I is this, that any burgeoning community, whether it be AIM, because we are a community amongst ourselves, whether it be London, whether it be Britain, whether it be any nation from the level of the Ummah down to the states that we live in. He says any burgeoning society, any burgeoning community needs to realize that within them, they will have both those things which are according to goodness and also those things that will be amongst them which are corrupt. And that there is an ongoing battle between these two. If the corrupt outweighs those goodnesses that exist within the society, over a period of time, those corruptions will pull down the society, even if there is goodness there, and eventually the society will be filled with those corruptions. The burgeoning community needs to keep on top of its responsibility of pushing back those corruptions in order to ensure the goodnesses remain revived, improve, and become the dominant feature of a community. It is not just about the recognition of deviating from the truths that you know about. It is ensuring that those evils within society do not become the majority of the way in which society runs. Now think about what's happening in the world. And particularly, I give the example of the United States of America. In order to help us to think through what is happening in front of our eyes. I will also come at the end of the discussion to what's happening here in the UK. But I think the United States is a very good place for us to start and think and reflect upon this ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَكَانُوا مُسْتَبْصِرِينَ They had knowledge, vision. They could clearly see what was happening in front of them. But still, وَزَيِّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالُهُمْ Think about what's happening right now. We mentioned yesterday that there's an election cycle going on. You all know that you have two candidates, Donald Trump and, and Joe, Biden. Joe Biden. And we mentioned yesterday that the reality is that they are very similar. They are cut from the same cloth, right? Even if you end up with Joe Biden in January, even if you end up with Joe Biden, he is only, at best, going to take you back to those conditions which bred a Donald Trump in the first place. Right? I don't know how much you follow American politics. Try to keep an eye on it. And right now there is what's known as the Republican National Convention, where they basically nominate their nominee for president, and they have three, four days of nonsense and speeches and you know you would like to think that there's some policy in there you would like to think that there's you know the idea is to put yourself ahead in the polls and give the voters some hope of what you wish to be able to present them with for the next four years if you take a step back 
and just have a look at what's happening across the United States at the moment, it's very interesting to compare and contrast the realities on the ground versus what has been coming out of not only the Republican convention over these last three nights, but even last week with the Democratic convention. I don't know how much you follow the U.S. circumstances, but let me just list off four or five points and build you a picture, right? In California, there are raging forest fires. Have you seen these? They can't even put them out, correct? So California is burning, and this has been happening actually for a couple of years where it's been out of control. It's been very difficult for them to be able to control these fires. This is a story within itself, which we don't have time to go into. Fires are raging across the West Coast. And I mean that literally, not metaphorically. Yesterday and today, in the states of Texas and Louisiana, the strongest hurricane on record has just hit landfall in Texas and in Louisiana. We pray that all people are kept safe. However, already we know that there has been some casualties. One tree fell and landed on a house and crushed a child. I think a 14-year-old child to death. Allah yarhamu. COVID-19 has so far killed 180,000 people and counting, right? And they have a president that sometimes floats the idea of injecting bleach into themselves in order to find a cure for it and many other hoax things. As a result of COVID, as with most places in the world, this isn't particular to the United States of America, but they are undergoing a severe economic crisis, correct? And actually we know that many people are on the verge of being made homeless because there is no moratorium on rents. People are unable to pay and what will happen in three, six months could potentially see a number of people being ejected from their houses. May Allah protect them all. They're also on the cusp of a third civil rights movement. We all know three months ago there was a famous shooting. We all know two nights or a couple of nights ago there was another shooting of Jacob Blake where he had seven shots in his back whilst his kids were sitting in the car having to see this. Have you all seen the outcome of this? There's been 90 days, 90 days of sustained daily protests that actually erupted into the Black Lives Matter movement around the world. Today, even basketball, probably the most famous sport in the United States, has come to a grounding halt because even the playoffs, the players are refusing to play whilst these are the conditions that prevail. I don't know if you know this. You know in that town that this shooting happened two, three days ago to this poor individual, Jacob Blake, when he was shot seven times in the back going to his car, in that town erupted protests. There has now been militias, militias of 3,000 people, they said on Facebook, as in they announced that we managed to get 3,000 people on the ground to go and block the protesters. So now you've got protesters for Black Lives Matter movement and to defund the police and to make fundamental changes within the society. And on the other side, you've got armed militia. You may have heard that one of those armed militia gunned down two of the protesters and injured a third. According to some videos, the police, the police are actually now working with those militias, handing them out bottles of water and literally saying thank you for helping us against the protesters. Now, if you followed their politics, for example, the last three nights of their convention, what you find is that the Republican National Party are actually saying 
things that do not match the reality of what's happening on the ground in order to make their base fear the other side. They are literally talking about things that do not reflect the reality. They'll say things like, Joe Biden wants to open up the prisons and let everyone out. What they mean by that is, because it's a term for racism, it's a, it's a, it's a dog whistle. What they mean is more black people are going to come back into the societies. It's a fear-baiting thing for them. He wants to defund the police and scrap the police. He doesn't. He doesn't have an interest in making fundamental changes, let alone Kamala Harris, the possible future vice president, who her herself was very much locking people up and making sure that more black people went to jail. They say things like terrorist organizations like MS-13, they want to be let into the country from South America in order to take over suburbia and basically all of you poor white folk, your towns and your cities are going to be overrun with drugs, black people, people from South America, immigrants, terrorism, so on and so forth. Think about this very carefully. At the moment, there's a pandemic. At the moment, there's raging forest fires. Climate change and global warming has hit them so bad that they're having hurricane after hurricane, which is stronger than any records before. Their own people are gunning each other down in the streets based on political rivalries of being either from a blue state or a red state, from the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. When the leadership says things which are not about the reality of what's going on, you will realize how this verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to light. There are people, as the Quran says, Allah makes their deeds to be fair seeming to them. They justify the way in which they allow oppression and corruption to take place. And as a result, those societies are doomed to collapse. He, shaitan, completely blocks them from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَكَانُوا مُسْتَبْصِرِينَ Whilst they were looking on, they were seeing it, they understood what was happening to their societies, but they became helpless to change anything at all. Stephen Colbert, I don't know if you know of him, he's a comedian stroke political commentator, probably the most famous of all the political commentators. You know what he said last night about the Republican National Convention? Why should we watch their reality TV show when it does not even reflect our own realities? What's going on on the ground and the pains and the sufferings of the ordinary person is being completely ignored. As he says, quote, Donald Trump does not care whether you die of being gunned down, whether you die from racism, whether you die from COVID, so long as he wins the next election. That's all he cares about. Now, if you've understood this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us principles in the Quran that when the leadership of a society, when the community themselves are completely blind to the corruptions that exist within their own faces, right in front of them, they may be seeing, but the reality is they are blind. And as a result of this, the corruptions grow and grow and grow and will end up pulling the society down. The attitudes of one to another, the way in which we treat one another, the way in which we look after one another, whether or not we actually try to stop the dhulm that is occurring in a society or not, has a direct impact as to whether that society is going to prosper or fail. 
In Surah Saba, chapter number 34 of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a story of a community that by virtue of one group of people pushing down another, stopping another from coming up, making sure that they didn't live the reality of the other, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed that society as an outcome for the way in which they were living. This is a very important set of ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in chapter 34 verses 18 to 19. Pay close attention and live these verses. Understand what Allah jalla jalaluhu is presenting about building a community, building a society, the attitudes that we have amongst ourselves for one another. When we see dhulm happening in front of our eyes, whether we turn away from it or whether we work to changing or whether we build the dhulm one after the other. He says the following. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. وَجَعَلْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ وَبَيْنَ الْقُرَىٰ أَلَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا قُرَىٰ ظَاهِرَةً وَقَدَّرْنَا فِيهَا السَّيْرَ سِيرُوا فِيهَا لَيَالِيَ وَإِيَّامًا آمِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets forth the example in history of a town or a set of towns, set of towns, communities. He says the following. We had placed between these towns a distance. We had set a distance between these towns. Right? London to Birmingham is a certain amount. London to Milton Keynes is a certain amount. Allah says that we had placed between them and the towns which we had blessed allati barakna allah blesses these towns fiha quran zahiratan wa qaddarna fiha as-sayr such that it was easy to be able to travel between these two towns it was comfortable distance to go from london to birmingham mecca to medina in this example yeah Allah gives these towns. He has given it opportunity, comfort, ease between these towns to be able to travel between each other. And then he says, Siru fiha layalia wa iyaman aminin. Travel between them in comfort, night and day, in a state of peace, safely travel between them. The commentators mention why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions traveling at night. Siru fiha layalia wa iyaman. Aminin. Travel at night and at day. Why travel at night? Normally we try to travel during the day, especially at that time, right? Because you are more likely to find difficulty at traveling at night. The commentators say, because of the order of these words, this siyaq of this ayah, it is showing that Allah had made it so peaceful for them that even if they wish to travel at night, where there's potential animals that might attack them or robbers that might attack them. Allah has made it peaceful for them, safe and secure. And they will be able to go even at night to be able to where they want to get to. This is how comfortable their towns were between them. Now, the rich folk, the powerful of that community, those towns, made a dua to Allah. Listen to this ayah. It's the subsequent ayah. Verse 19. فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا بَاعِدْ بَيْنَا أَسْفَارِنَا Oh Allah, make it more distanced between us and them, the travel. Make it more difficult for them to be able to travel to us. Huh? Allah Jalla Jalaluhu is saying, I have made these towns a comfortable distance of travel between you. It is blessed and safe. Go ahead and make travel. The rich and elite and powerful of those communities made a dua to Allah to make it the opposite. Make it more difficult, distance to be able to travel between us and these towns. Allah says, وَذَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ they did so much wrong to themselves by making this du'a. What's going on here? The rich, they wanted to keep this blessing for themselves. So they made the du'a to Allah, 
make the towns difficult to be able to travel so that we, the elite, we, the powerful, only us get this privilege of being able to travel whilst the rest of them, the poor, they don't, be able to, they don't get to be able to travel as easy as we do. It's like this. You know, some of us, we have a British passport, an American passport. Outside of COVID days, it me or Brexit days, it means that we can travel wherever we want in the world, right? Basically, we can go anywhere, get any visa for anywhere, right? You want to go to India? You can go to India easily. Can the ordinary Indian get here easily? No. Because we have a three-tiered system in this world that says that some people have privilege, some people don't even have basic human rights. And I'm sorry, but if you're born at the bottom of the ladder, so be it. You don't get the privileges that we get. What do these people make du'a for? Make it more difficult for them to travel. You know, just yesterday, I don't know if you saw it, you know, we've been talking about some of these uh, refugees, the asylum seekers that have been coming over from Calais to Dover. Did you see yesterday, someone put a, you know, you can put like a, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, you shine a, like a projection. Yeah, you can shine a projection onto something. Sometimes they shine a projection onto, you know, um, the Houses of Parliament, and you can see an image, right? You know, yesterday they shone a projection onto the white cliffs of Dover that said, refugees not welcome. Rabbana ba'id bayna asfarina wa zalamu anfusahum. There are people that really want to keep their privilege and hate the idea of other people coming up, having any access to basic rights, access to justice. You think it's just a matter for then? People here today are exactly the same. You could be in the Republican National Convention. You see people being gunned down by the police. Seven shots in the back, but you won't talk about it. You can be in this ayah that you see those people, Allah has given them a privilege. But because you want to keep that privilege, you keep it for yourself. You even make a dua against what Allah has honored, such as the freedom of movement, the human rights to be able to travel. They know what they're doing. They see it, but they don't realize that all of this is going to be the downfall of their own societies. Look at what Allah says in this ayah. فَقَارُوا رَبَّنَا بَاعِدْ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارِنَا وَظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَحَادِيثِ وَمَزَّقْنَاهُمْ كُلَّ مُمَزَّقٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know what? We made you a story for people to be able to learn and we destroyed you, we scattered you an absolute scattering for your du'a. For the way in which you knew that people had a right, but you wanted to destroy them anyway. You wanted to oppress them anyway. You wanted to pull the rug from under their feet so they couldn't climb up the ladder of social mobility. What's worse is when people see it in front of them, they're mustabsireen, and then they allow themselves to follow into that path. Now yesterday, we talked in some detail about Surah Al-Mumtahina. Do you remember? And we talked about the idea that Surah Al-Mumtahina demonstrated to all the surrounding nations the extent of the justice in Islam. That even those who are your enemies, the pagan men who had lost their wives into Islam, Baytul Mal would still look after their right and return back there, Siddaq and their Mahar. Do you remember this yesterday? Yeah. And you can imagine how the onlookers of all societies are looking into Medina and saying, Subhanallah, what a society that we want to be part of. And we stated that the institutions of Islam thereby need to be under the purview of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And when you see that these institutions are run under God's justice, under God's wisdom, there are certain outcomes of this. That those institutions there will allow people to excel. They will be allowed to go up. They will be allowed to raise their standards of living. It will remove the oppressions on them and they can excel in their lives. It allows them to have rules and regulations and a society in place that builds all of these different societies together. And in the end, those people buy into the laws of God and then it becomes a cycle that the next time a law of God is revealed, they buy into it because they recognize that the previous law of God worked for them. It brought them out. nur. So tomorrow, if another ayah is revealed, if another legislation is revealed, if another way of living is provided for them, if the previous one was based on justice and wisdom and it benefited you, tomorrow you are more likely to be able to go back towards whatever ayah is now going to be revealed to you in the city of Medina. As a result, they can begin to dismantle their old systems of living and they are able to start living in the way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted them to live. Now, do you remember yesterday we mentioned that there were two chapters that were revealed? Surat Al-Mumtahina, maybe the fourth or fifth chapter to be revealed in Medina. And what was the fifth or sixth one? Surat An? Nisa, ahsantum. Barakallah fikum. Surat Al-Mumtahina, and then was followed by Surat An? Nisa. So now in Surat Al-Mumtahina, you are seeing these women of Mecca are fleeing to Medina. They are sensing the type of justice that they are able to get. Everywhere else, they are seeing the justice that is being put into the Muslim society. And now Surat Al-Nisa is being revealed. Surat Al-Nisa, the theme, the maqasid al-surah, the goals, the aspirations of the surah is what? To be able to look at all the different downtrodden groups within the society and to find laws and attitudes that could help build them up. In a society, think about this very carefully. Help me, give me some answers. In a society, name to me the different type of blocks within society, the different groups within society that can be downtrodden, that can be mustada'afeen, madhlumeen, Give me an example. Women. Women. That should be obvious by the title of the surah, An Nisa. That the primary group within society, not just then, until today, the most oppressed people in society are women. Exploited group in society are women. And don't think for a second that is not even in our own communities, our own Husseiniyat our own masajid, our own nations, in front of us it happens. وَكَانُوا مُسْتَبْصِرِينَ What else? Which other groups are downtrodden within societies? Minorities. Brilliant. For example, we talked a few minutes ago in the United States of America, the black community. You still live in fear that if you're a black man, you cannot walk down the street without being gunned down by the police. Otherwise, there will be no need for a Black Lives Matter movement because the sentiment is that they don't really matter. Women, minorities, orphans, widows, slaves and until today there is modern day slavery all of these groups and many more that i'm sure you can name one after the other after the other and then pick out certain circumstances tells you that these groups in society are systemically oppressed and very rarely do we see anything from within the system lifting them out of their poverty, lifting them out of their ignorance, lifting them out of their exploitation. The first thing the Prophet ﷺ did in Medina was what? Bring the mu'mineen together as brothers. 
We went through this on a few nights ago. The next thing that he did was what? He got the faiths together under one banner of believing in Tawheed and working Lillahi Azza wa Jal. We went through this. Then yesterday, the third thing that he did was establish a system where everything ran under the purview of God Almighty alone. All the institutions. The fourth thing he did, according to the order of these surah that are revealed in Medina, the fourth thing that he appears to have done is to lift all of those underprivileged, all of those exploited, all of those downtrodden groups within society. He lifted them up group by group by group, ensuring all of them had access to righteous laws and justice within the society. Look at Surah An-Nisa. Read it tonight when you go home, brothers and sisters, and see how many groups of people are addressed and the laws and infrastructures that are put into the society in order to elevate this society one after another. Opening verse, opening verse of Surah An-Nisa. Look how it sets the theme of the surah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuhan nas subhanallah everyone is being addressed male female black white free slave every spade of society is being addressed ya ayyuhan nas ittaqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida have consciousness fear your lord the one who created you from a single soul وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا بَثَّ مِنْهُمَا رِجَالًا كَثِيرًا وَنِسَاء Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spread you as countless men and women. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيْكُمْ رَقِيبَا Remain mindful of Allah, whose name you make requests of one another, and beware of severing ties of kinship. Allah is ever watching over what you do. From the outset, Allah is addressing these different groups in society and saying, take care of how you deal with these people. Men, women, your family, all the underprivileged groups within society. Throughout Surah An-Nisa, this is the theme of Surah An-Nisa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nisa, raise your voices if there is dhulm. Wherever you see an oppression, stop it. Don't allow it to go in front of your eyes for you to become amongst those who are called kanu mustabsireen. La yuhibbu Allahul jahra bisu'i min al-qawli illa man dhulim. Allah does not like that evil to be mentioned openly, to be discussed Unless it be by him who has been wronged. إِلَّا مَنْ ظُلِمْ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ سَمِيعًا عَلِيمًا Allah is all hearing, all knowing. People came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. One individual came to the Holy Prophet of Islam, Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I just can't seem to change myself. You know what he said my problem is? I have a hard heart. This surah is about being soft-hearted to all of the mustad'afeen in society. Women, children, orphans, slaves. Not seeing their plight and just walking by. He says, Ya Rasulullah, my heart is hard. Now you know, Especially according to our great scholars, especially the Arafa, they go into detail into removing hard-heartedness, right? They talk about the reasons for hard-heartedness. A person who eats too much meat, for example, hard-heartedness. The sins that become ongoing, hard-heartedness. This person comes, of course, Rasulullah understands the individual that he's speaking to, as well as the collective that he is speaking to individual comes to him and says ya rasulullah my heart is hard i can't seem to have affection and deal with people the way in which i'm supposed to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa says change your behavior you will see 
that your hard-heartedness is removed. He says what? First and foremost, have mercy on orphans. When you see an orphan, he continues, when you see an orphan, pat them on the head. You see, sit with them, engage with them, make them feel like someone cares for them. And then he says, give them from your own food. You see how he's training the individual to break what is on him, the shackles that are on him. To break those shackles that are upon his heart. In Surah An-Nisa, you will see time and time again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses different groups within society in order to aid them in gaining their rights. As an example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nisa, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَآتُوا الْيَتَامَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ وَلَا تَتَبَدَّلُوا الْخَبِيثَ بِالطَّيِّبِ وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا أَمْوَالَهُمْ إِلَىٰ أَمْوَالِكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ حُوبًا كَبِيرٌ Give orphans their property, their rights. Do not replace their good things with bad things. And do not intentionally mix up their property with your property in order to consume it for yourself. This is a huge sin. What does that tell you? That habitually at that time in Medina, people were stealing from orphans. In order for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have to review, uh, reveal an ayah for it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues with other ayat. He says as an example, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la yuhillu lakum an talithu nisa'a karhan, wa la ta'adhulu hunna litadhabu bi ba'di ma ataytumu hunna illa an yatina bi fahishatin mubayyinatin wa ashiru hunna bil ma'roof. فَإِنْ كَرِهْتُمُوهُنَّ فَعَسَىٰ أَنْ تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَيَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Believers, it is not lawful for you to inherit women against their will. They are not objects. Which tells you what? That the way in which women were treated at that time was like an object. Nor should you treat them harshly in the hopes that you would regain the mahar that you have spent on them pushing them towards doing an indecency in order for you to divorce them and take back their mahar from them. Which tells you what? That this is what the Arab men were doing at that time. Live with your wives in a good and fair way that should be appropriate, the ayah says. If you dislike them, it may be, well, that's actually something that is good for you. It's something that actually you shouldn't be disliking. God has made it a source of abundant grace. Surah An-Nisa. Teaching you how to be able to treat your wives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues. And he says, for example, and this verse is in another chapter that was revealed. Surah An-Nur, chapter number 24 of the Quran. This is one of the next chapters to be revealed in the Quran. Look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Stop your exploitation. You see an exploitation in the society? He actually says, stop your exploitation of women in the society. Listen to this verse. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَلَا تُكْرِهُوا فَتَيَاتِكُمْ عَلَى الْبِغَاءِ إِنْ أَرَدْنَا تَحَسُّنًا لَتَبْتَغُوا عَرَضَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَمَنْ يُكْرِهُنَّ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِكْرَاهِهِنَّ غَفُورٌ رحيم. Do not compel your women, your girls, against their will into prostitution. Tells you what was happening at that time. That they were doing this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, La taktalu amwalakum, la ta'kulu amwalakum baynakum bil batil. Do not eat up your wealth amongst each other in falsities. You know, there's a narration that comes to us from our sixth Imam as Sadiq, Salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. He says, one of the reasons for the revelation of this ayah was that men in Arabia. They used to gamble, and when they lost their bets, instead of settling their debts with their own money, they would sell their female family members into prostitution, billah, to pay off their debts. This is what people were like. وَلَا تُكْرِهُ فَتَيَاتِكُمْ عَلَى الْبِغَاءِ إِنْ أَرَدْنَا تَحَسُّنًا لَتَبْتَغُوا عَرَضَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا 
Do not compel them into this out of your desire for short-term gains, a little bit of money. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifts those women, those ones who have been forced, don't lose hope in the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have been compelled, Allah is forgiving and merciful of them. Stopping one side, but also helping another side to get out of what they are doing. This is very important, brothers and sisters. If you have a scale, you all know what the mizan looks like, right? If you put lots of small stones on the scale, right? Let's say it's balanced. And eventually you put more stones on this side. What will happen? The scale will go down, right? And the more stones you put, the further the scale will go down until it hits rock bottom. The society is the same way. The more you push people down, the further they will go. And those people on the other side of the scale, they are pushing this side down. What happens to the other side? It goes up. One group within society goes up. One group in society elevates itself. It gets more and more money. It gets more and more power. It gets more and more influence. And at the same time, the other side of society goes further and further and further down until it hits bottom. All along, the ones who are here, they are seeing what is happening to the ones down here. Wakanu mustabsirin. From the other perspective, those who are being pushed further and further down, there is less and less chance for them to be able to make a change. Because as you are adding more weight to this side, it becomes more difficult for them to be able to make a change. The distance between the two of them grows and there's nothing this group can do about it. The oppressed get more oppressed. Whilst the elite become further in their elite. When you see it happening in your society, you are obligated to be able to make those changes. Whether it be in your own society or across the ummah as well. You know, in July of this year, we're almost reaching September, right? So there's two months, July, August. Did you guys hear in Leicester about those slave workers being found in Leicester? Did you, did you hear about that? Yeah? Yes or no? Yeah. yeah, you heard it, most of you? There's an interview. Remember, I gave you some homework. I said, go and read Surah An-Nisa tonight and see what the Prophet ﷺ was trying to do to bring up mustada'afeen, madhlumeen in society. Listen to this. In July of this year, in Leicester, there was a leaked video of a group of people working in a slave sweatshop, making clothes for a well-known set of brands, right? When it came out, it became national news, and everybody started talking about it for two, three days, and then, of course, it went off the radar. Why would they want it to stay on? On LBC, on the radio, there's an interview with one of the MPs. This one is the one who replaced Keith Vaz. Andrew, I forget his surname. Andrew something. Conservative. And he is interviewed. He's only recently come in. And he's interviewed about what's happening in Leicester. You know what he says? Search it. This is your second homework for tonight. right? LBC. The title of the video is something like Everyone knew. That's the title of the video. LBC, everyone knew what was happening in Leicester in the sweatshops. Everyone knew. Just type that in and you'll find it. You know what he says? He says, in that area, in Leicester, there are 10,000 slaves working in these sweatshops, making us clothes. Habib Galbi, this is not Vietnam. This is not China. This is on our doorstep. They see it. They know what's happening. Ten 
thousand slaves. You know what he said? These are his words, huh? This is the MP. He goes, I've been documenting this for years. I finally given the, the details over to the to the police, to 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 the people that are specializing in slave traffickers. He says, you know, one of these sweatshops, it is literally, literally across the road from the police station. He goes, the police twice a day have to walk past this place to get to work, to leave work. Wakanu? Mustab Siri. 10,000. You know how much they're earning? £3.50 an hour. And in the COVID situation, they're being forced to come to work. You know why? Because you and I were unable to go shopping in the normal shops. Where were we purchasing everything from? Online. So people who wanted to buy, they were going online. So these people were forced to come in and work because they were producing for online outlets, not the stores. No windows. This is his words. MP. No windows. No air conditioning. And everybody is set together. No social distancing. These people, it is the highest location in the country where COVID is centered. You all know only a couple of weeks back they had to close off Leicester for a while, right? Why do you think? You know what he said? In that area, one out of eight is a slave. Statistically, in that part of Leicester, that council area, one in eight is a slave. When people see treachery and evil happening in front of them, and they don't do anything about it, they don't lift a finger to make a change, and then the elite get more and more powerful, longing for their power to increase. The mizan goes more and more distanced. And those people make a dua, Rabbana, oh Allah, make more distance between us and them. In the metaphoric sense, right? Make more distance, make a greater gap between us, the rich, the powerful, the elite, and the poor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the outcome is only one destiny. This is why today people don't realize the United States of America is actually a failed state. It was at this juncture that the Prophet ﷺ would tell his community time and time again, you, the ummah, are one body. If one part hurts, the rest of the body feels the pain. At this point, the Prophet ﷺ said, من أصبح ولم يحتم بأمور المسلمين فهو ليس بمسلم. The one who wakes up in the morning and does not have a concern for what's happening in the rest of the ummah, he is not from us. He's not really, in the real sense, a practicing Muslim. He could be by name, but the reality of there is a distance. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ It really hurts the Prophet when he sees what is happening to the believers. It kills him when he has to see what we go through. You see, all around us right now, the pictures of the shuhada. Allah raise their station and grant us to be amongst them one day. وَقَتَلًا فِي سَبِيلِكَ فَوَفِّقَ لَنَا وَصَالِحَ الدُّعَاءِ فَاسْتَجِبَ لَنَا Whether it be Leicester, or whether it be Bahrain, or whether it be Nigeria, if you see what is going on, and you don't raise your voice, and we don't raise a finger to be able to make a change in the oppressions that are killing any group of society. Women, widows, orphans, black, white, Sunni, Shia, Christian, atheist, 
none of it matters. Any group within society that is mustada'af, we are responsible to help change their situation in one way or another, whatever we can do to raise these groups within society. Otherwise, we end up exactly like those that are mentioned in Surah Al-Ankabut, وَكَانُوا مُسْتَبْسِرِينَ We just watch on whilst the destruction of our own society takes place. There is no point, listen to these words of mine, there is no point in looking on at the Donald Trumps of the world who see in front of them their societies crumbling with people who are going broke and about to be thrown out of their houses. Not having any infrastructure or PPE for them. Allowing them to pollute so badly that now hurricane after hurricane after hurricane destroys their towns. Seeing people being gunned down in the streets and just looking the other way. There is no point in looking and pointing fingers at a Donald Trump if we are going to be no different from the Trumps of this world. On the night of Qadr, you and I do the Sibha, we do the Tasbih of what? Allahumma la'an qatalata amir al-mu'minina alayhi salam. There's no point in reciting that Tasbih if we're going to be with the same characteristics of those who killed Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. What point is there coming and weeping over Qasim ibn al-Hasan if we're going to act in the same way as the killers of Ahl al-Bayt alayhim The way in which we treat women, the way in which we treat a black individual, the way in which we look on and see killing occurring and not being able to even lift a finger to bother to help people. Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam calls out, O oh, Umar ibn Sa'ad, will you look on whilst Hussein is being killed? O oh, army of Yazid, is there not a Muslim amongst you that you allow Hussein to be slaughtered thirsty and yet you recognize he is the grandson of Rasulullah? Umar ibn Sa'ad, what did he do? He just turned his face away. وَكَانُوا مُسْتَبْسِرِينَ Qasim alayhi salam was an orphan in and of himself. He had lost his father Hassan alayhi salam to the poisoning that had gone into his body. When Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam had taken that poison, it is said that part of his insides came out and that he would turn it over by a stick. But yet, with his last agonizing moments, in which when the poison is running through his body and he's unable to even lie comfortably and he's moving left and right, at this moment, Hussein ibn Ali comes to him. Imam al Hassan alayhi salam looks into the eyes of his brother and begins to cry. Hussein says, Do not weep, my brother. Allah is with you. The Prophet is with you. Our mother is with you. Our father is with you. Soon all your pain will go. You will be with them at the pool of Kothar. Hassan alayhi salam cannot help but look on and say, O oh, Hussein, I do not cry for my own sake. I cry for you because you are going to be there alone on the 10th of Muharram. There is no day like your day, O oh, Aba Abdullah. I wish I could be there but I will send in my stead my son Qasim ala la'natullahi ala al-qawm al-dhalimeen wa sayya'lamu al-lazina dhalamu ayyum al-qalabi yanqalibun inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam to allow us to be alongside him at all times in our life and in our death if we are to pass away from this world before his coming, Ya Allah, raise us from our graves so that we can partake in the victories of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Ya Allah, grant us the ziyarah of Aba Abdullah al-Hussein fi dunya wal-akhirah. And whatever hajat that we have tonight, 
to accept them. Bihaqi Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.